Hello, and welcome to this next part of the course, where we are going to talk about safety and hygiene in ultrasound guided injections, specifically around the nerves. This is the outline of the talk. First, we'll start with some injection safety issues. We, we will discuss how you get a good view of your needle, how to handle the probe, how to assess the correct needle length and the angle you should take as your approach. Then obviously, we're gonna discuss a little bit about tips to avoid structures that you don't wanna puncture. And the second part of this talk will go into some basic hygiene and sterility aspects, your probe cleaning equipment, sterile gel, the use of gloves and protective covers, and the difference between office-based and surgical hygiene. Let's start out with ultrasound guided injection safety. Is that an important issue? We think it is. And this is just a short case example. Here's a 60 year old female, we will show you the ultrasound images shortly, who underwent her third knee replacement. The surgery was performed under general anesthesia, but also a femoral nerve catheter was inserted for pain management post op. On the right, you see an illustration where the nerve is outlined in green with a small white stripe overlying it um, that indicates the catheter position for the analgesic fluid. Now, this lady woke up and then she was unable to lift her knee or stretch her leg at the hip joint. And physical exam confirmed a severe paresis of the iliopsoas muscle and the slightly less uh, severe paresis of her quadriceps. This was confirmed by AMG later. We were requested to perform an ultrasound study to see if we could find the site of the lesion. Here is the images from this lady. On the left, you see the normal uh, femoralis nerve, a little more proximal to the catheter site, so five centimeters proximal from the inguinal ligament. And on the right, you see the site of the lesion. As I can understand that you might not be familiar with the femoral nerve in this area, I've outlined the anatomical structures for you in the next slide. So you can recognize the femoral artery, the fascia lata, the iliacus fascia, and the nerve is just underneath that fascial sheath. Now you may also appreciate that the nerve on the right looks slightly different. It's larger. And if we go back one slide, it's also slightly more hyperechogenic. But just to give you an indication of such a catheter placement and the risk involved, here is a short illustration taken from a public YouTube channel. You can see the needle going through the fascia right next to the nerve, which is then next to the artery. Some fluid is injected. The nerve is to the right of that fluid. A little more fluid is injected. And when satisfactory, the catheter tip is left there right next to the femoral nerve. And you can imagine that it might be possible to actually damage the nerve during this procedure. So we measured the nerve in this case. Again, on the left, the normal image on a proximal site, and it was similar distal to the inguinal ligament. And on the right, you see the focal enlargement. And just by area size, you can see that something is not okay at this point, confirming the lesion. So, if we've seen this, how can we reliably and safely target a nerve with ultrasound? Well, you need the basics, obviously. So you will need a linear transducer, preferably one with a broad megahertz range, so you can target either deeper or more superficial structures. You will want some cleaning wipes for your probe on the machine and sterile gel if you're going to go into sensitive areas. A marker pen or a pencil is always handy and you will need to have a long enough needle. Then obviously a syringe, the injection fluid and some sodium chloride might be useful. And if you have an assistant, extra hands are always welcome, although they're not always available in our practice. Let's go back to targeting a needle safely. There are two main approaches used for ultrasound guidance of needle injection. One is the preferable method on the left, that is in-plane needle placement, meaning that you will have the whole needle into view under the ultrasound probe. This works well for shallow insertion angles with respect to the probe surface. So if the angle of insertion is less than 45 degrees, or preferably even 30 degrees or less, you will be able to see the needle just fine. But if that's not possible, or you need to do a very deep injection, 
and the probe angle is larger than 45 degrees with respect to the probe surface, then you might want to have to resort to out of plane needling, meaning that you will insert the needle until it, one part of it comes into view under the probe. But be careful because this is not always the tip and you don't, you're not always sure where that tip actually is. Now here's a short video showing you in, guy, uh, in plane needle placement in a phantom. So you can see the needle coming in from the left here and you can see the reverberation artifacts under it. You have a complete view of the needle, the tip, the bevel, and next some of the fluid will be in, injected and you can see it appearing right here. That is a very safe and secure way to inject around the nerves. Sometimes you just can't get to it that way and you need to do something else. And then you go out of plane. And this is an example of out of plane needle insertion with the probe still. So we'll just start the video here. In the red circle, you see the needle appearing and the artifact is moving. And now it sort of moves out of the circle. But you actually, if you don't move the probe itself, you're not looking at the tip, but you're looking at the shaft of the needle. And you don't know where that tip is. It might be hurting a structure a little further down. So if you want to do this, you need to resort to some other technique. And the best way of doing this out of plane is to actually move your probe when you're moving the needle. And that's this short video. Here you see the needle coming into view. Every time the needle is moved, the probe is also advanced in the same direction. So you keep a view of the tip. And this is a more secure way of doing out of plane injections. Now, sometimes you, if you have a deeper uh, target, you could also use a step down approach where you insert the needle and uh, at a slightly more shallow angle and aim than you need to go. And then you stepwise increase the depth until you're at the target. And in the phantom, you can see an example here. So there's the needle appearing. It's the tip, obviously. And we insert it a little deeper so you can see the tip. And here it is again. And every time the needle tip reappears, it's at a slightly deeper position right there. And finally, it will be completely deep in the image. This is a step down approach. This is also more controlled than just one single insertion. The next thing you will need is anatomical knowledge. So here we have this image of the carpal tunnel entrance with the median nerve. And you might wanna ask yourself how you can go in plane and reliably target that nerve. There are three main issues here. First, you need to know how deep the structure is. And then you'll need to assess what needle length you need to get there. And obviously you also want to know if there's anything in the path of the needle that you would wish to avoid. So, as far as needle depth is concerned, every ultrasound screen I'm aware of has depth markers along one side. So you can see the, uh, the median nerve is actually between 0 0.5 and 0 0.8 centimeters here. So now that we know that, we can calculate the needle length. You will have to get across the screen. And if you go straight down, in this case, meaning an angle of zero, you only need that depth for your needle length but that is not something that's gonna get the needle into view. For in-plane technique, you need a much shallower angle. So it might be slightly confusing because the 60 degrees that we need here is actually 30 degrees with respect to the probe surface. And if you're gonna do that angle, which is optimal, then you will need at least twice the length of the depth of your structure. So if you're gonna go two centimeters deep, as in this example, you will need at least four centimeters needle length and preferably a little bit more. So choose the correct needle for your procedure. And finally, you can use your anatomical knowledge and landmarks and maybe Doppler to find anything that might be in the path of your injection. So here in this case, if the white arrow is the needle, you might find the ulnar artery and the nerve in your way and you need to circumvent those. Now, how can you get and keep your needle in a good view? Well, there are some probe maneuvers that we're gonna discuss. You could use a gel standoff for your probe, and you can also move the needle, especially in out of plane views, with the power Doppler setting on so you can track the movement. And some people want to inject a little bit of anesthetic fluid or sodium chloride to see the tip, and that's called the blushing artifact. Remember that if you're using an in-plane technique, the ultrasound's image slice is a very small diameter, so just one to two millimeters wide. 
Here's those probe maneuvers. On the left, you see translation, which basically means that you are moving the probe until it's right over that needle. So in the top part of that image, it's not over the needle at all. And then you sort of slide it over to be straight above it. Rotation is when you um, are oblique to the needle and you need to rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on how you handle your needle and the probe until you have the whole needle lined up underneath it. Make sure that you do that because otherwise you get what's called a cross-cut artifact shown on the top right here, where you actually think you may see the tip, but it's just part of the needle in an oblique view. And that is not very secure. Now, another trick you could use if you have a too large insertion angle, so a deeper structure that you need to get to, is healing in of the probe. You could push one edge of the probe into the skin or the subcutaneous tissues to create a better angle for your view. And this will bring the needle into a much nicer view. And finally, if you have a very shallow target uh, and you have no room for maneuvering the needle, you could use what's called a gel standoff. So you put a lot of gel on the spot and then insert the needle in the gel, keep getting it into view. So the corresponding image for this phantom is on the right here. And basically what's going on is this. So you create an extra set off or standoff for the needle to get into view so you can safely insert it in the skin for a very shallow target. Now, finally, you could use this trick to detect needle movement. So if I turn the video on, you can see the needle tip appearing. It's here. And it's also picked up by the power Doppler setting. So every time you move the needle, this is sort of a slight step down approach, you will see it. Now in this phantom, it's not much of an issue. You can see the needle anyway, but in scar tissue or very fibrotic areas, this might be a lifesaver to help you find that needle tip in an out of plane view. Okay, that was the safety part of the talk. Let's go to the hygiene aspects. If you are going to do ultrasound injection, then please just adhere to any basic hygiene standards, both personally and professionally, meaning you and yourself are clean. You've taken off all your jewelry. Uh, you do not wear long sleeves, for example. You have your hair tucked away, so it's not gonna go into the area you're treating. And these are all the basic requirements for our profession. And one of them is very important, and that's just basic hand hygiene. Bad hand hygiene is actually the single most common cause of nosocomial infections. So just keeping your hands clean, sterilizing them with a little fluid is very effective in reducing infection risk. Next, sort of gave this away, I think. But there is a very provocative study that's been performed by a group that looked at the cleanliness of the surfaces of ultrasound machines in the emergency room versus public toilets. And then the question was, what would you rather touch? Well, I think you might already seen it from my uh, inadvertent slide progression there, but the study found that actually these public toilets are much cleaner to the touch than the ultrasound machines in the emergency room because they apparently never got clean at all. And that is not very you know, uh, professional or good for your patients. So as a very basic thought, try and just keep your equipment and your probe clean. You could only use a paper towel. If you do that, you will wipe off 45% of the organisms already. So wiping off gel of a probe is effective. You could use alcohol to clean the surfaces. Um, be aware that it's not 100% effective against microorganisms, especially spores are not killed by alcohol. And be also aware that alcohol is destructive for rubber surfaces. So if you have a probe with a rubber surface, then you might slowly degrade it if you use alcohol for cleaning. In practice, we find that these um, hydroxy peroxide wipes are usually best. They are a very effective sporocyte, uh, viral and bacterial cleaning agent that are much used for any equipment in the hospital setting. They're easy to use uh, and it's, a good practice to just clean your probe and the machine before and after each patient. Should you use sterile gel? Obviously, <clears throat> the image on the right is not actually what's going on in these um, containers, right? It's just for illustration purposes. 
Um, if we look at sterile gel, there might be times when you do want to use that because normal ultrasound gel is not bacteriostatic or bactericidal. In fact, studies have found that 25% of the reusable gel itself and 70% of the bottle tips were contaminated with skin pathogens when testing. Now to prevent this in your regular ultrasound gel bottle, it's advised to seal the container after you use it, don't leave it open, not to refill the bottles, so not the big five liter package right next to it, but use a new one every time. And do not warm bottles for extended periods of time. Modern ultrasound machines often come with the option of a bottle warmer, and that is very comfortable, especially for small children or elderly patients. But if you do use a bottle warmer, make sure that you um, use new bottles every time you enter a new day in a new clinic. Otherwise, there will be bacterial buildup in the bottle. Now, if you have a high-risk procedure, for example, you want to inject in a sterile environment of a joint, or you have someone from a high-risk population, such as a patient on the intensive care unit or an immune-compromised patient, you might want to use sterile gel. That is the most effective way of making sure that there is no contamination from that end of the study. Should you use a sterile probe cover, as is shown here, and maybe even a whole towel? Well, <coughs> they are recommended, but in themselves, they are not enough to ensure sterility of your procedure. And one disconcerting study found that right out of the box, already almost half these covers had been perforated, so they were not air and fluid tight and not sterile thus. So do not rely on just a probe cover to be sterile. And what about the protective gown and the masks and the gloves, all the surgical equipment that you're familiar with? Well, they are actually not to protect your patient. They are just to protect you. So if you do not want to get splattered by blood or other bodily fluids, this is what you need to wear. And that's also why surgeons wear them, but it's not protecting the patient from you or the machine or the probe. So finally, that, let's discuss the concept of office hygiene. So just your regular outpatient clinic versus surgical sterility. The basic office clinic sterility is usually sufficient if you're gonna do injections around superficial limb nerves in a not critical patient or environment. So then you just clean the probe, record on the equipment with the disinfectant wipes before and after you use it. You clean your hands, you wear gloves, they can be non-sterile. And then you use single or first use gel and needles for injection and keep the needles and the injectate sterile until the injection has been performed. In some cases, you really need the surgical sterility environment, so deeper injections, let's say the obturator nerve in an obese patient, or high-risk patients with uh, immunocompromitation or uh, skin breakage, and high-risk environments such as the ICU, then do as above, but then do use the sterile gel, the probe cover, the gloves, the needle, the injectate handling, and the whole towel. And if you also need to protect yourself, then don the apron and use the face shield. This is a small demo of an office-based carpal tunnel injection. So here's identification of the nerve, where you see the palmaris longus tendon, and now the flexocarpi radialis tendon highlighted. Next, the Doppler is turned on to identify any vascular structure that might be in the path of the needle. We just saw the radial artery and vein, and now we're gonna cross over and see the ulnar artery there. And after they've been identified, the patient has been cleaned, the non-sterile gloves have been done and the injectate was taken sterilely. We're injecting in an in-plane fashion. You see the needle approaching the median nerve here. It's not penetrating the nerve and slowly injecting the fluid around it. And it's advisable to first go under the structure you want to inject. Otherwise, the artifacts from air and the fluid may obscure the view if you first go over the nerve. So when you're satisfied with the fluid having spread around the nerve and the sufficient injectate in your uh, patient, you can just withdraw the needle as is done here and then finish the procedure by hemostasis. So I would recommend ultrasound guided injections as they're much more effective and safer than just blind injections, but please do it safe and please do it clean. Thank you very much.